Thank you so much for joining Brown University's Executive Master of Healthcare Leadership webinar series today. If you're joining for the first time, welcome. And if you've attended other webinars from our program in the past, welcome back. Brown University's Executive Master of Healthcare Leadership prepares leaders to transform healthcare. It's a 16-month program designed for clinicians, executives, and senior administrators with significant responsibility in the healthcare industry. It blends on-campus and online learning, allowing participants to work full-time while pursuing this advanced degree. Throughout the program, participants focus on innovation and leadership, and how to really be change makers in their organizations and throughout the healthcare sector. So today's webinar offers a snapshot into the collaborative classes taught in the Executive Masters of Healthcare Leadership program here at Brown and offers insight into how students are able to apply these high-level business principles into their organizations in real time. So today I'd like to welcome one of our faculty members, Jim Austin. Jim teaches the Management and Marketing course for this program. He's also a principal at Design Strategies International and is a former senior executive at Baxter Healthcare. Dr. Kirti Patel will join Jim today. Dr. Patel is an OBGYN at UMass Memorial Health Alliance Hospital and a member of the Executive Master of Healthcare Leadership's inaugural class of 2015. Thank you so Thank much you for joining us today, Jim and Kirti. Thanks. Thanks, Angela. This webinar, as Angela just explained, will explore innovation and as an example of the content covered in the Executive Masters of Healthcare Leadership. I'll both discuss what is innovation. And oftentimes it's hard to get your hands around. What do we mean by innovation? We use it in so many different contexts. So discuss the concept or the idea of innovation and then provide, as Angela said, some application frameworks. And I'm so pleased to be joined here by Dr. Patel because part of the, 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 the differentiation of this program is its emphasis on application. And Dr. Patel will then speak after me on how she's used within her clinical setting some of the ideas presented. So let me dive right in. What do we mean by innovation? Let me ask you, do you think this is innovation? This is actually a product out there, and uh, it's been actually transformed into something, uh, so, uh, an another possible product. Here's the next one. This is actually sold in the Far East, so if you have young children, you can, uh, I suppose, leverage their need to uh, explore their surroundings into uh, dust collectors. Anyway, my, my question to you for those listening in is, is this innovation? And I want to propose the following definition. Innovation is a new match. It's a, it's a way of bringing together ideas or technologies to provide a solution to a commercial need. It has to have a market impact. It doesn't have to be patentable. It can be incremental or radical, and I'll explore that in a minute. And it encompasses the broad range from products, processes, services, models, financial models, and so on. What do I mean by that uh, difference between innovation and maybe invention, for example? This is some work by General Electric. And in their world, they define basic science as invention, science for science's sake. Of course, they would say they focus more on applied science, but still, science for science's sake versus innovation. Innovation has that practical, marketable, business value side to it. So when we think of innovation, it's not just simply the creative act, but it's rather the creative act that results in a market or a substantial change in the environment that we're operating within. And as I indicated, there are many kinds of innovations, from product to technologies, environmental, and cultural. That's, I think, in part what makes it so hard to get your hands around what do we mean by innovation. The other side of trying to understand that definition is this concept of little i versus big i. All too often, I think, we, we, we use the term innovation thinking of, say, Google or Amazon. When in fact, if you look at the, at, 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 if you just simply mapped all of the innovations occurring around us, most in fact are what they, what, what I call here little i. This is some work out of Wharton, uh, Harvard, Brown. Uh, concept is 
most entities are making incremental changes, are, are focused on continuous improvements. And really, and, and part of that is because of the risk-reward trade-off, which we will get to in a second. Note I also begin to talk here about red ocean versus blue ocean. For those that haven't read Kim and Morberg's book and articles, Blue Ocean Strategy, their concept is most of us compete in what they label the red ocean. So these are fixed industry boundaries. These are fixed market shares or, or fixed parameters for how we compete. And it's basically a zero-sum game. So I, I try to grab market share from you. You try to grab market share from me. In today's newspaper, specifically, there was an article about Best Buy and how Best Buy is going to meet every low cost out there, uh, whether it's on Amazon, whether it's on Walmart, whatever. They said, we're going to be the price leaders. And of course, who do they then quote? But Walmart. And Walmart said exactly the same thing, which is the classic definition of red ocean. Blue ocean, on the other hand, and we'll be using this framework throughout, blue ocean, on the other hand, is seeking that uncontested space, seeking that those new opportunities, seeking those, those areas where there isn't existing competition, in fact, creating something new. Now, note in the blue ocean, high risk but high rewards, which leads me to the next slide. This is some work, again, by George Day out of Wharton, and he was looking at over 20 years of experience across industry. So this is not specific to healthcare, but he would argue there are three specific ways entities can grow. They can stay within their current market, current customers, current patient groups, and offering their current products and services, but just doing what I call line extensions. Instead of making a red tip protector, we're going to make a blue tip protector. In that lower left-hand box there, those new line extensions, those new launches, those, those process improvements, only 50 to 70 percent of the time are they successful. That means even with the existing customers and your existing products and services and just making minor tweaks, only 30 to, uh, you, you face failure rates of 30 to 50 percent. If you move straight up to that upper left-hand box where you are staying with your current geographies or your current markets, your current patient groups, but offering some new products and services, success is only 40 percent. It means 60 percent failure. If you go down to the bottom right-hand corner, so we're staying with our current products and services, but we're trying to open up a, a new extension office. We're moving into some new geographies, or we're, or we're finding some new customers. 70% failure, 30% success. Now, before I talk about the big I, the large innovation, that upper right-hand box, note the difference between the bringing some new technologies into existing customers, the rate of success, versus having the greatest things since sliced bread, but trying to find that new customer. It, what, what, what's, being what's being outlined here is it's always easier to, to introduce a new, a new product, a new technology into your current patient group than to try and get that new patient. The issue with Apple isn't one of it's great technology, it's cool, everything works, it's buying the first Apple product. Once you're a member of the Apple family, everything fits together. And that's really the difference being talked about between those two boxes. Now, note I talked about big I, high risk, high reward, 90% failure up in that upper right-hand box. This is, this is like having a, a team of nine Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was the home run and king, but he was also the strikeout king. You can't have a baseball team in which you have nine Babe Ruths. You'd either be winning games by 30 runs or losing games by, by, by uh, enormous differences. So um, how do companies use this, this approach or try to balance big I versus little I? This again is from General Electric, and here's how they think about their portfolio of initiatives. So, Innovation, let me step back. Innovation means bringing some new ideas, some creative blending of things already there for a market purpose. As you move from small i to big i, and small i, of course, is easier, but it has lower reward. As you move from small i to big i, your risk, but potential reward increase. However, to have a balanced portfolio, so you're not betting the bank on, on a few NASDAQ holdings, for example, you need to have that balance between what GE calls box one, 
or incremental innovations, even though they show these boxes of equal size, in fact, most of their innovations are down in that lower left-hand corner, or you have what they call adjacency, so related customer groups, related technologies, or selectively target powerful opportunities. So point one of innovation is it's a very broad term that ranges from low risk to high reward. And the way to think about it from a practical application side is how do we both focus on making what we're currently doing more efficient, but at the same time layering on some selective, powerful opportunities for change and growth. And if you read Blue Ocean Strategy, you might have come across this chart in particular. And one of the points that Kim and Morberg are trying to make is that most launches, mo businesses by and large focus on red ocean initiatives, those small i activities, what they've labeled here as the red line. And these are percentages of launches over a period of time. I believe they were looking at Europe specifically, but it holds no matter what market they were looking at. So their point is, in rough terms, I'm rounding up here, 90% of launches are red ocean, only 15%, 86% are red ocean, 14% are blue ocean. Um, the revenue impact, though, 60-40, but look at the profit impact the other way around, 40-60. However, what they don't talk about is the risks. Yes, you have more profit potential from the blue ocean, but remember that 90% failure rate. So given that, that, that brief introduction to what the heck is innovation, how you might think about it, how do, you, how do you want to frame the opportunities or the challenges in innovation, I want to provide three specific frameworks that we used within the seminar uh, to, help, to help students like Dr. Patel think about how can I take these ideas and apply them in my situation. And three in particular that I want to quickly go through are one, current current offering, current differentiation, what Kim Moorberg called a strategy canvas or a value curve. And I'll give you an example of that. Then secondarily, pain point analysis. So the concept is first you need to have a diagnosis. You have to understand where are we different, where are we same in the, in the eyes of the customer. And this is all from the patient's perspective. This is from the outside in. The other change in blue ocean thinking is instead of saying, Let's keep pushing out. Let's keep making our current offering products and services, our, our current ways of serving patients incrementally better, but basically keep, keep our, our pushing those ideas out into the marketplace. The concept of blue ocean, the concept of true breakthrough innovation is step outside of what you're doing. Stand in the shoes of the patient and try and say, how can we overcome their issues in new and creative ways. And that's really the pain point analysis. Then finally, this concept of the four paths. And the idea of the four paths is the biggest strategic management question is, I believe, can you get to where you want to get to by running harder? Is this primarily an efficiency game, or do we have to do some things differently? The idea of the four paths is we, in fact, have to do some things differently. At some point, you can't continue to layer on additional tasks, additional activities. You have to say, we're going to downplay certain things of being lower value to the customer, even though we've done them in the past. We're going to downplay some of those, and we're going to increase areas that help differentiate us, areas that lead us into more innovative areas. And let me take you through what I mean by each of these. So remember, I first said, you need to have a diagnosis. Where are we today? And and this idea of a strategy canvas or a value curve, that value picture, I think is a wonderful tool for practitioners. There are two parts of it. Along the bottom are from the patient's perspective, not from our perspective, but from the patient's perspective. What are their key value differentiators? What are they looking for? Think about when you go to purchase an automobile. There, there are really only four or five things you typically think about to decide, am I going to go domestic or international? Am I going to go uh, tw for a $20,000, $30,000, $50,000 car? I mean, certainly price is one of them, reliability, style, um, two-door, four-door, um, ease of, ease of uh, getting repairs, image in the marketplace. It, it, and that's really about it. That's probably 80% of what leads you to one dealer versus another. Same idea along the bottom here. 
The second area is this relative offering level on the other axis, low to high, one to five. This is very much a qualitative differentiation. What you're trying to do is map your own product and service against an alternative from the patient's perspective. So using Viagra. Viagra, in fact, was the first product um, that failed in clinicals, and the patients did not want to return the samples. First time ever clinicians went into the field and said, well, we now have to retrieve these samples, and patients said, no, you know, might not have been great as a hypertensive, don't know, doc, but let me tell you, it has some other effects. At which point, Pfizer said, I wonder what we have here. And what they found was, in fact, Viagra did some other things, out of which Pfizer created a, a, a whether, whether you uh, su support what Pfizer tried to do, as a, as a marketing management person looking at it, absolutely hilarious. You remember some of those early Viagra ads where the man walks into the party and everybody suddenly Start, start staring at them, and they're saying, oh, did you get a new haircut? Did you have a new jacket? I mean, the, the whole tongue-in-cheek uh, thing of the, of the uh, ads is they're looking at the wrong level, of course. So price of Viagra versus other branded pharmaceuticals, well, they're expensive, but they're not off the charts. However, look at all the emphasis Viagra and Pfizer put into on packaging and advertising, emotional appeal created a glamorous image. I mean, most branded pharmaceuticals have no image at all, except that either keeps me healthier or, or not. And oh, by the way, it's not that effective. Only two-thirds of males taking it, in fact, have an, have an effect. So branded pharmaceuticals have a higher effectiveness in that sense, and you tend to see your doctor uh, at a more consistent level. When, we, when you go in to your doctor and say, I might, ha might need uh, Viagra, I might have erectile dysfunction, which, by the way, it's a disease that the Pfizer really created. If you go back to the 1980s, there wasn't a, a common designation of erectile dysfunction. So none of it created the disease. They created all this image around it. And, that, and once the doc writes the, uh, once the script uh, for Viagra or Cialis or whatever, that uh, he, he or she does not need to see you for probably 12 months. So the ND role is much lower with Viagra than with typical branded pharmaceutical. Why I went through this is, I think this is a wonderful way of portraying how you differentiate today, right now, your diagnostic of how are you different from an alternative, from the competition, in your offering of products and services. And we don't often stand in the shoes of our customer and try and say, how are they looking at us? We tend to say, oh, I have a great patient panel, I'm in demand, um, I write these periodicals, uh, I'm a, a senior leader in my hospital, and that's good enough. What, what innovation is asking is that's the traditional way of competing. That's the traditional way of differentiating oneself. The concept of Blue Ocean is let's step outside and do things differently. And the first step in that, the first part of that process is standing in the shoes of customers. So when you think about these frameworks, here's just a blank template you want to ask yourself, what might be those value differentiators on the bottom? What, on, an, on a qualitative scale, one to five, low to high, how are we different? And whether it's customer or whether I'd, I'd like to speak more about patients, how do you win? And how are you winning today? But that's only today. What you need to then do is talk about the pain point analyses or look at what options are there for future change. And this table, again, coming out of Blue Ocean Strategy, I think is very applicable to the healthcare se setting. Um, column one there, stage of the patient experience. Think about this from the patient's perspective. How do they first identify a need for care? Is this just a checkup or is something wrong? How do they then assess options? Do I do inpatient, outpatient? Do I go to my family practitioner? Do I need a subspecialist and so on? Now I check in to get my treatment. I receive the treatment. And then is there some follow-up, whether there was an operation, whether there was um, uh, some specific interventions, what sort of follow-up is necessary? And at every one of those, think of those almost like a life cycle of engagement between the patient and the provider, or the patient and the institution. At every one of those, from that patient's perspective, what are some of the pain points? And I know that Dr. Patel, in particular, in a few minutes here, will speak about how she and her comrades in her, in her practice have used this framework, for example, to try and increase the, the innovation within their practice and the, 
and the custom and the patient uh, response um, to the care that she's being that she's delivering. So those pain points might be something like how easy is it to get an appointment, for example. And then that third column, well, this is where you start brainstorming what could we do differently. And remember, in that context of small I versus big I, most of the ideas probably will be incremental, probably be process changes, but maybe there's the opportunity for some new breakthrough ways of doing things. Maybe you could have some online signups. And I know more and more outpatient clinics are doing that. How can you make that seamless? How could you tie that to a phone app, for example, without going overboard with technology? But what are the opportunities for really developing some new innovative ways of changing healthcare? And so remember, I said the third part is this is not a question of simply layering on, of simply trying to do more with less. I, I, I like this four paths concept. What do we eliminate? And everybody says, oh, we can't eliminate something. But in fact, if you ask patients, there probably are some things being done that they don't highly value or that aren't as important to them as other parts of the care that they're receiving through, through the clinician's office or through the institution. And there are some things you could reduce so that you can focus resources and focus time on raising or even creating those innovative opportunities to serve patients better. And throughout, of course, I hope you fight against this. Your proposal is innovative. Unfortunately, we won't be able to use it because we've never tried something like that before. I really appreciate your attention here on this webinar. And again, I hope we emphasize the two points that Angela started with, some frameworks and then how those frameworks could be applied. And with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Patel. Jim, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Um, I'm really honored to be able to take part in discussing such a worthwhile topic. I also just want to add that it's really been a thrill to be part of this first cohort of students in the EMHL program at Brown. It's really a wonderful group of students, and I enjoy having all of these future healthcare leaders as connections and colleagues. Everyone is really passionate about improving healthcare, and this program has been such a tremendous opportunity for all of us uh, to learn about the challenges that we're facing. And it's courses um, like Jim's that are going to help us develop creative solutions to transform healthcare and solve our current crisis. Um, all of our courses have been very information dense and so valuable, and this lecture by Jim is a great example of that. There are just so many takeaway points from just this one lecture. Many of the concepts that Jim talks about here are employed on a large scale, and it's not so easy to think about how someone in the trenches, uh, a practicing physician like myself, might be able to apply these ideas. So what I really appreciate about Jim's approach is that he makes the material readily accessible for us to use immediately in our current work settings. The value curve and the pain point exercises were a great example of this. Um, in class, Jim actually had us work in, our, in small teams, and um, we created a value curve for various types of healthcare organizations, and then used the pain point analysis to assess how we can improve processes and create more value for our patients. Uh, I thought this was a very eye-opening exercise. Historically, medicine has been very physician-focused, and you know, unlike other industries, which are much more consumer-focused. And we've had a lot of discussions in our introductory courses, healthcare policy, strategic planning, and now management and marketing, about the need for healthcare to become more patient-focused or patient-centered. And I thought the pain point analysis was a great example of that. It was powerful to think of the entire process through the eyes of our patients and ask, you know, how can we make their experience better? Um, and I have to admit that before this class, I, I thought I was being patient-centered in my approach. But what I realized was that my idea of being patient-centered um, began when I entered a patient's exam room and focused on her concerns for the allotted appointment time. But doing the pain point analysis made me realize that a patient's experience with me begins well in advance of that. Actually, it begins when she picks up the phone to make an appointment with me. 
and doesn't end until her medical problems are completely addressed. So every point um, from calling to make the appointment to coming and to parking in our parking lot to waiting in the waiting room, dealing with my staff at the desk, seeing me in the exam room, the actual treatment, checking out and then following up with me again, all of these elements, the entire chain of events is the patient's true experience with me as a provider. And all of these events have to be factored in and improved if we truly want to be patient-centered and create a rewarding and valuable experience for our patients. Um, I found that exercise to be so valuable and one that I was able to use immediately in my current practice. And I'm, I'm sure that many of the other physicians in my class felt the same way. Um, I, I believe there's two thirds uh, of, I believe two thirds of our class is physicians. So this was really a great takeaway for all of us. Um, the, the other topic that I particularly enjoyed from Jim's lecture was regarding Blue Ocean strategy. I know that many of my classmates were also very inspired by this topic. Um, having worked at a number of healthcare organizations over the past decade, I've observed a common theme. Most are facing huge financial challenges with the rising cost of healthcare and declining reimbursements. And now with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, organizations are going to be facing even more pressures trying to maintain financial viability in the face of new um, regulations. So, so much of um, healthcare is in the so-called red ocean and so much of the focus at these organizations in term, terms of management is focused on, well, what can we do to cut costs in order to survive? So, you know, and while I think that's certainly important, um, I, I also just love the idea of also thinking in terms of blue ocean strategy, the idea of trying to create new desirable products or services uh, for patients and opening up entirely new markets as a result. And that's just very exciting and inspiring. I think that just has a lot of potential in helping us to solve our healthcare crisis. So, um, but I want to thank you, Jim, for you know uh, inviting me again. And um, as you can see, I'm already finding some real-world applications for your coursework. And it was such a pleasure to be able to talk to you about it today. Thank you, Curti. It's been great working with you and your colleagues in the program. And I've learned a great deal from you also. So thank you so much. And with that, let me turn it back to Angela. So uh, Jim and Kerte, thank you both for, for giving us a window into the Executive Master of Healthcare Leadership experience here at Brown. I'm really excited to see how quickly, Kerte, you've been able to put the course content to work. Um, and I know that many of your colleagues in the program have been able to um, approach their learning with the same vigor and immediate practice. So for all those in attendance, I invite you to send any questions you may have about the webinar or about the Executive Masters of Healthcare Leadership Program to um, execmasters at brown.edu. And I will make sure to follow up with you following this webinar. And stay tuned to our website, brown.edu slash executive, for updates on future master classes that we will schedule after the holidays. And we will feature um, faculty and students from our program in, in um, additional courses in January. So thank you all for joining us today.